So today I want to talk a little bit about fathers, and I found an amazing outline for the sermon in the Sermon on the Mount. But I want to get your mind thinking in the direction of fatherhood. So here's a question. Two fathers and two sons went out fishing. After catching three fish, one of them said, that's enough, let's go home. Were three fish enough? Well, there's your answer. Do you see it? Two fathers and two grandfathers made up in three people. So three fish is enough. For one of these men was a Grandfather, another was a grandfather and a son, and the other a son. Life is interesting. That relationship, though, is what I want to talk about. Not just the fact that a person is a grandfather or, or a father, but more that there is that Christian element that needs to be injected into that relationship and that will dominate that relationship. So when we, when we start talking about the work of a Christian father, even a Christian mother, where would we go to find an outline that is just perfect? And I don't know if you'll agree with me or not, but that's okay. Because not everybody does all the time. Ask my wife. No, don't ask my wife. To be the best father, be the best you can be as God's man. If this were a Mother's Day sermon, you know how that second line would read. Be the best you can be as God's <laughs> woman. Train your children to be God's children. So here's where I found the outline. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. How is that an outline on how to be a godly father or mother? <coughs> Let's start off with our Father who is in heaven. Hallowed be your name. If you want to be the best father or mother that you can be, make God <coughs> your father and honor Him daily. Let your children see that honor. Let them see and hear the respect that you give to God. Let your children know <coughs> your dependency upon Him as your spiritual Father. Let your children hear you talk about your Heavenly Father. Consider 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6. There is but one God, the Father from whom are all things, and we exist for Him. A child who is shown by their father or their mother that they exist for God are giving their children one of the greatest gifts that they can possibly give to them. Another passage, this time in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 9. We had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? One of the things that a father or a mother shows their children 
is how to do the things God wants them to do that they would rather not do or maybe even hate to do. Is it possible to be pleasing to God and do something that you really don't want to do? Is that even possible? Is that not hypocrisy? Was Jesus a hypocrite when he prayed in the garden, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me? Did not Jesus show us the importance of being an example of doing the will of God when it is so hard to do? Do you know what that tells our children? It tells them God is very important to my mother and my father and mama and daddy put it first. What a powerful lesson that is. And not only does that help to produce children for God, it also allows mom and dad to be a faithful servant of God. But his prayer goes on. He says, your kingdom come. Make the church a priority. How important is the church in mama and daddy's life? How important is attendance? How important is it to show up on a work day? How important is it to learn how to teach a class? How important is it to learn how to lead a prayer? How important is it to learn how to visit the sick? Let the children know the significance of the church. In fact, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, Seek first His kingdom, that's the church, and His righteousness. One thing that a godly father and mother will show their children is the place of the church in their life. We never had a discussion at our house are we going Wednesday night? It was a done deal. We never had a discussion about whether we're going to Bible class. It was a done deal. My parents taught me as a child the importance of those things. As an adult, I had to learn them for myself and make my faith that belief. I couldn't rely upon their faith. There had to be a time of transition when I no longer said, well, I remember one time asking a group of teenagers, how many of you would not be here unless your parents made you? And several hands were raised. I wouldn't be here, my parents made me. There has to come a time when that faith shifts from following my parents' faith to making it my faith. Making the church my priority. And that's what good fathers and mothers do. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 20 and 21 tell us, To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. But the prayer continues. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Child, I love you with all my heart, but I want you to know the will of the Father comes first. Did you know that really believing that may lead you to some of the most difficult decisions you've ever made in life? Some people are actually given the choice. It's either me or the church, not both. Some have made the choice for God. Some have made the choice for their mate or their children or even their job. But to be the best father or mother that you can be, these will be your words. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so to obey the will of God, the covenant of Jesus, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9, He became to all those who obey Him,
the source of eternal salvation. Or 1 Peter 1 and verse 22. Peter writes, You have in obedience to the truth purified your souls. Our children and our grandchildren need to understand we are saved and why we are saved. And what brought about that salvation. There is no greater gift that can ever be given to a child than the message of how to please God. What are you going to be when you grow up? Oh, I think I'm going to be a massage therapist. And the reason I mention that is because one of the girls who works down at the donut shop is going to graduate in December and be a therapist to do the will of God. This morning, Lori at Egbert's, I said, is there anything we could pray for? And of all the things I thought she said was her friends, and I wasn't hearing what she said. I said, what was that? She said, sobriety. Sobriety? How long have you been free? She said, one year and four months. Yes! Yes! Obey the will of God. Let our families and our children know <coughs> we will fight the devil himself with the help of God to be one of his children. And we wear the armor of God. And our children know we wear the armor of God because they see it in our life. But the prayer continues. Give us this day our daily bread. Fathers and mothers provide for their family. And this is talking about material provision. I know there is a certain dependency upon God, but we also understand that we're not the children of Israel in the wilderness and God delivers vanilla wafers every day to our doorstep and all we have to do is go out and gather some. I understand vanilla wafers may be our nearest equivalent to the manna that God gave to the Israelites. I don't know. I like mine with peanut butter. I don't know about you. <laughs> but I do know this. What I can do, God expects me to do to provide for my family and then to depend upon Him when I've done all I can do and that's all I can do. Give us this day our daily bread. Look at for this necessity of life. If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. God has several things to say about people who can work and will not work, but rather prefer to be fed by other people's efforts. And in the Lord's Prayer itself, he talks about the necessities of life. And using God's resources for those necessities, and one of God's resources is the ability He gave us, the strength He gave us, to go out and work. How many times have I talked to people who own restaurants and they've complained that they can't get people to work for them because they say, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do this, I can't do that. So the thing is, what they would like would be for the boss to send them a check and let them stay home. And that's what our government is doing with a lot of people, in my opinion. But the point is, even material things are included in being a good mother and a good father. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28 talks about a thief. So what should the thief do? He must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Stop stealing and start working. Loose translation, but I think it's accurate. Amen. Fathers and mothers show children how to work and how to have a work ethic that is honorable. I do know this. Talked about it this morning with Amber. People who are employed, who are honest and will work hard, 
will be worked harder than those who are untrustworthy. Because if you have a job that's important, you're not going to give it to somebody who's not trustworthy. You'll give it to the one who is. And sometimes they're overworked. And they know they're overworked. And they know they will continue to be overworked because of their honesty and their integrity. And children learn that from their parents. Hopefully. But the prayer doesn't end here. Forgive us our debts. Sometimes a child needs to see mama or daddy bow down and say, God, I was wrong. Forgive me. Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Repentance is the hard part of becoming a Christian for many people, maybe all of us. For that involves our dying to self and our choosing to live for Him. It is our deciding to take His yoke upon us, whatever that yoke is. And to be yoked with Jesus means to pull in the same direction that He's pulling working to be the same kind of person he is, doing those things that are enjoyable and those things that are hard, just like Jesus did. And then in 1 John 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. A prideful parent often will produce an unrepentant child because the child has not seen how repentance works. A child hasn't seen the brokenheartedness of sin. The child hasn't seen the request for forgiveness nor heard it. I think it would be true, wouldn't it, of all of us? We want our children to be better Christians than we have been. We want them to be stronger in the faith. We want them to reach out a little further than we have reached. We can't make that happen. We can only encourage that journey. But then here's another part. It's not just asking forgiveness of God that our children need to see and that we need to practice, but they need to see us forgiving other people perhaps even when they don't ask for it. <clears throat> Stephen was dying. They were hitting him with stones. The ultimate objective was to take the stone, perhaps the size of a grapefruit, and at a fairly close distance, hit him in the head. But before that happened, Stephen said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He wasn't forgiving them on God's behalf. He was forgiving them on His behalf. They would have to deal with what they have done with God. But Stephen said, don't hold it against them on my account. Don't send them to hell because of me. And that's what Jesus did when he was on the cross. Children need to see us forgive. Even when people don't ask for forgiveness. They need to see us turn loose of grudges and bitterness. Because when they don't see that happen, they begin to believe that it's all right to hold bitterness and grudges in their own heart, not realizing the torment of carrying bitterness and grudges that it has in the heart and the soul of the one who carries it. 
Love and forgive those around. Forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father in heaven will also forgive your transgressions. Ephesians 4 and verse 32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other. I realize that forgiving someone doesn't mean that they escape the consequences of the wrong they have done. I understand that. I understand that when Stephen, when Stephen said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, they still had to deal with God in their sin. I know that when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, Peter was still holding them accountable to God for what they had done, even though Jesus says, don't hold it against them for my sake. And I even realized that when David said in Psalm 51, against thee only have I sinned, he was simply saying, Father, when all is said and done, I've got to make it right with you. When all is said and done, I must make it right with you. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's a challenge for a mother and a father. Because your children will come home saying, but they're all doing it. I feel so bad when I'm left out. Nobody likes me because I'm different. Everybody else is wearing this. Everybody else is doing that. And their, and their folks go to church where we do. Well, I've heard that. I've had to say to my children, Honey, son, I'm not asking you to do this because I'm a preacher. I'm asking you to do this because I'm a Christian. And I realize that sometimes my judgment is only 5149. But as a father, I have to go with the 51, not the 49. Because God will hold me accountable if I knowingly go against my better judgment. And that's when it's really hard to be a mom and a daddy. It is hard. But what you're teaching your children is you can make the hard decisions for the right. You can do it. Pursue moral excellence. We turned off a television program the other night when this girl went up to this other girl and said, I like you. Okay. No. I mean, I really like you. We knew where it was going. Turn it off. Turn it off. <coughs> Do you know what an adult movie is? Tell me after service is what you think an adult movie is. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, Jesus said. 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 8. Applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your and he continues with several other virtues following this particular passage. To be the best father, pursue moral excellence. To be the best mother, do the same. And the prayer continues. But I want to sum it up this way. Make God your Father and honor Him daily. And this applies to all of us. Make the church a priority. Obey the will of God 
the covenant of Jesus. Provide the necessities of life. This is not in my notes, but it does make good sense. Learn where the line between wants and necessities occurs. Because sometimes our children like to draw the line a whole lot further into the area of wants rather than necessities. And so do we. Walk humbly in need of God's forgiveness. And I add, rejoice in it. Thank God every day that you can pray and walk forgiven. Love and forgive those around us. Pursue moral excellence. On television the other night, two dentists came on and they were rejoicing that United Healthcare is now going to help pay for dental implants. How many of you have a dental implant besides me? Wow. It's a deal. It's a deal. I had to have an oral surgeon cut out the old tooth and I had to have a specially trained dentist to implant the new one. Can you make spiritual application? The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. There's the surgery. Putting Christ into your life as you ought, that's the implant. And they screwed that thing in and then did something to add glue on top of that. I hope it's there still when I die. But more than that, implanting these qualities in our children begins when we have implanted them into our own life. Where does it start? It starts with hearing the Word of God and believing it. It continues as we choose to repent of our sins. And it continues when we're willing to confess our faith without shame, but with confidence, willing to tell anybody, anywhere, anytime, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And when I am to that point, I am ready to be baptized into Christ, to share in His death and His burial and His resurrection. After all, when all is said and done, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. What does that mean? Jesus, I'm yours. Son, daughter, I belong to Jesus. And Jesus, my children, are yours too. be the best father, to be the best mother you can be, begin here. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And because we belong to Jesus, we point our children to him. The lesson jurors. We're going to stand and sing the hymn of invitation because our desire is that each of us of accountable age and understanding leave this building in a right relationship with God. But if you have more questions and want to study, if I sit down and study with you, I'll give you book, chapter, and verse and let you read it for yourself before I tell you what it means. Because I want you to see for yourself with your own eyes and your own mind what God's Word is for you. Let's stand and sing.